It's so good to be with all of you today. Happy to see each one. I want to uh, begin a new series of uh, lessons to do once a month or so during this first period of time that we have uh, on different duties and uh, different prohibitions that are given in God's Word. And to begin uh, the list, we have a duty that is a great blessing to us if we'll obey of studying God's Word. And, of course, that's what we're here for today is to study the Word of God. But we may need to make effort to study it in our daily life as well if we want to grow up in Christ and assure ourselves of being on the path to heaven. We need to be constantly applying ourselves to the study of God's Word. It's a basic duty that needs to be continually encouraged so that we might grow. I guess it's one of the first things you would encourage any new convert in Christ is to study your Bible, read the books of the Bible, know, know the Bible, become a master of it. But it is a duty that goes on throughout our life. We need to continue to emphasize it. We have a duty to be a proper workman uh, in the sight of God that will be well-pleasing in his service. And we've got to be able to handle God's word correctly. And that takes a constant study and reminder of what the Bible teaches Present yourself approved to God is what the command that's given to Timothy is in 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. So steady, constant effort is what it means to be diligent. And so certainly this lesson applies to you and to me that we continue to study. Something I was... Uh, encouraged to hear Greg say in his Bible class, he mentioned his daily Bible reading. Well, that's great. That's what we need to be doing is have some dedication to daily Bible reading so that we are continuing to learn so we can be accurate, that we can conform our teaching and our life to the truth without making mistakes, be accurate in the application of God's word. And there are many dangers, of course, as we've talked about in Many lessons in the Bible often warns of being ignorant and lacking knowledge about what your duties are, what the proper choices are, uh, what things we ought to be avoiding. In Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 16, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and uns they will distort as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. So we can see there is a danger of being untaught. Who is it that ends up twisting the scriptures and not taking them in their context properly or comparing them properly with other passages on the same subject because they have no knowledge of them and end up twisting what the Bible teaches? It's those that are untaught. And they end up resting the scriptures and what does it result in? If you're not practicing the Bible accurately, it can end in your own destruction, right? So obviously there is a great need to continue to educate ourselves so that we don't uh, uh, just see a part of the truth, but that we see the whole truth. We need to add knowledge. That's part of assuring ourselves of our calling and election on that last day that the Lord's going to choose us is that we grow in all of the virtues, and one of them that's mentioned is knowledge. Uh, it's not a miraculous knowledge. Uh, I'm not going to come down on you without your will. It's something you're going to have to get through study. That's the only way that we get it. God has provided miraculously an inspired scripture for us and confirmed it. And now we have to take uh, proper use of it. Just like if we want to uh, grow physically, we've got to take in the food. And we've got to chew it and we've got to swallow it. We've got to do our part, right? Same way with gaining knowledge. How is it that we should approach Bible study? What kind of attitude should we have as we uh, open up our Bibles and begin to read? Well, we ought to have a reverent respect for what we're reading when we study the Word. Because it's not the Word of men, but it actually is the Word of God. These men were inspired by God. It's it, just like the creative breath of God made all things in the beginning. The creative breath of God is what created our Bible for us. He worked through those uh, 40 writers of those 66 books, and he breathed his power and thoughts into those words. In the book 
of Second Timothy, it tells us it's all scripture are inspired of God. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Uh, and you open up a book and you know that it came from God and it has the mind of God and it's the word and will of God. Certainly it should be approached with reverence because it is speaking with the highest authority that there is in the things that it proclaims. And we ought to approach it with godly fear that we understand it properly and practice it. It ought to be meditated upon and deliberated upon so that we might fully grasp the things that are taught there and apply them in every way in our life. A serious consideration and reflection should be there. We're told in Psalms 1 and verse 2, but his delight, the, the righteous man, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Uh, oh, I, I could think about when I met Melissa and I, uh, she was my delight, you know. I'd sit around and think about her all the time. Look at her picture. When we, she was in Oklahoma City, I was in Ada. You know, and that what you do when you really love something, you, you think about it, you meditate on it. Same way with the Word of God. How do you approach it? It's, a, it's your delight. Uh, it's the message of life. It's the law of liberty. And you want to learn all that you can about it and think about it and apply it. It's what keeps us safe. In Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. So Joshua was told by Moses and by God that he needed to study that old law that was given to them at Mount Sinai and the teaching that was delivered through Moses, and think about it day and night so that he could do it, and it would make him successful as a leader over God's people and helping them take the promised land. As one who needs guidance is the way that you should approach the word with reverence, with delight, and with meditation and uh, recognizing you need it. You know, we, we're, never, we're never there when it comes to the perfection in this life that we need. We need to learn more. We need further guidance as we go through each phase of our life. And we, we cannot trust ourselves when it comes to matters uh, of morality and, and things that have to do with the spiritual realm and eternal life. Only one that can help us is God. And we need to be willing to listen to what he has to say when we read. In Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. We cannot trust just some inner light that we think we might have. God is the only one that has the answers about how to walk in a way that pleases him and a way that will lead to eternal life in the end. So don't trust in yourself. Trust in what the Word of God has to say. Approach the Bible reading that way. In Isaiah 42 and verse 16, God said how it would be in the new age when it came, the gospel age. I will lead the blind by a way they do not know, in paths they do not know. I will guide them. I will make darkness into light before them and rugged places into plains. These are the things I will do, and I will not leave them undone. So, who says I'm blind? I'm blind without God. Without his word, I don't know how to move about and how to, how to, how to reach heaven. I have no clue without God. He's got to lead me. We're all blind until we're illuminated by that word. And we need to approach it in that way on any subject that we're studying. He gives up uh, idols and self-religion and rely on him is what we're told. In 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 20, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become foolish that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, he is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. Think about all of the high educated, powerful minds in this world. When it comes to saving your soul and getting to heaven, they don't know anything about that. 
It's God that is the one that can tell us about that and his word. So confess yourself a fool and trust in God and his teaching. In Laodicea, those brethren were lukewarm in the faith. They were in danger of losing their soul if they didn't repent because they thought they didn't need anything anymore. So you get to a certain age, well, I've been in the church for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. I, I, I've heard it all before. I don't need it anymore. I don't need to read my Bible like I used to. That's when you're going to get into trouble. In Laodicea, Jesus said, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Writing to people in the church at Laodicea. But we need to look at ourselves and recognize we are blind without the Word of God. We need to read it every day and study it so that we can uh, approach it in the right way. It's not to prove a doctrine that we have the Bible. We have some doctrine that we're wanting to support, and we go to the Bible and we search here and there to try to uphold it in some way or another. That's not the attitude for Bible study. Our, our study should be the Word of God is the doctrine. God's word is the doctrine, and we are trying to seek to understand what it is. We want to read every verse on every different subject so that we can understand what the doctrine that the Bible teaches is, not to support some doctrine that we have. The scriptures are profitable for teaching, for doctrine, and it is the doctrine. As a truth seeker, we need to come to the word of God. The truth is what we're interested in, the facts reality what is genuinely god's word and his purpose and not um, what we'd like to hear in matthew 7 7 the way to approach god and to get blessed is to ask and it shall be given to you seek and you shall find knock and it shall be open so we've got to ask and seek and knock in order to have these things and approach the Bible that way. We're digging for the truth on the subject, not just to please ourselves. Uh, and the people that are noble-minded, we want to be like those people at uh, Berea that Paul came to, and he pr certainly brought the gospel to them. They never imagined such a thing, and they heard all of these wonderful things that Christ had done and fulfilled. And they search the scriptures to find the truth. Is what Paul is teaching accurate about Jesus, about the resurrection from the dead, and so on? Now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. They were truth seekers, and we need to be as well. In the final time that we have left, I'd like to look at some of the blessings that are de derived, try to motivate all of us to keep digging in the Word of God and make it a daily part of our life, make it something that we don't want to neglect in, in uh, Bible study, uh, or opportunities to hear the gospel preached. There's great blessings that come to us that we need to be reminded of, to motivate us, to keep, uh, keep being diligent. Here's the five things that are mentioned in 2 Timothy 3 and verses 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. I need to be taught and instructed about the things of God and how to live, how to resist evil and do good. And the Bible is the profitable book to do that. I need reproof for the things that I get out of line on and I'm wrong about, and I need to understand I'm wrong. The Bible is what can tell me that. And it can give correction and show me how to straighten things out with God through repentance and confession and prayer, how I can get that right. It gives us training in righteousness, a way to become a more righteous person through the discipline of God practicing the things of God's Word. It gives us the training program on how to conduct your life as a Christian. It furnishes us with every good work that God wants us to be involved in, in our spiritual mission that we have. It cuts the heart and pierces the heart. We all uh, need to have something get through to us and bring us to our senses. 
and help us to recognize our flaws, to see where our motives are impure and not right. What kind of power is there that can be wielded, that can convict you of your sins and your pride and your covetousness or whatever it might be, that can see your inner thoughts and reveal them? It's the word of God's got that power. That word of God's going to be applied to us on the last day at judgment. We better start applying it to ourselves before the judgment day so we'll be prepared. That we'll get these secret things corrected, straightened out. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. Of both joint and marrow. And able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It is operative. It's got power when you read the Word of God. It affects you like no other book does because it has the mind of God revealed in it. And it shows us what we're really like when we read. It opens us up, opens up our motives and our inner nature, our inner ideas, and helps us to see them for what they are. It is able to pierce us and convict us. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost, right? They heard that gospel sermon preached and they were pierced in their hearts after they heard the truths that were revealed by the apostle Peter. And the men and brethren, what must we do? In 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God, Paul wrote a letter to the church and they had many things that were out of order in the church of Corinth. And that letter uh, caused them sorrow. It pierced them. Caused them to see the error of their way and what needed to be corrected. It produced a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. It's what can help us guard our inner heart from sin and error. It's food for the soul, is the word of God, and why we ought to try to come up with a, some kind of regular practice of reading and studying our Bibles. Because it's food. It's like you need food uh, in order to support your physical life in this world and your physical body. You can't do without it. If you neglect eating, uh, you get weak, you can't function and do your work. The same is true with the word in our life. As far as our spiritual man is concerned, it's got to have the food. It is the milk <clears throat> for the babe and it's the, the strong, solid food for the mature in Christ is the word of God. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word, that you may grow in respect to salvation. We've all seen in others and experienced, I think, if you've been around for very long, uh, in your own, own soul. You, you've seen when you're not able to come to worship because you're sick or for whatever reason that you get weaker. You're not the same in your strength as you were before. People that fall away uh, from the faith, it's often a gradual starvation that brings that about. They neglect the power that's in that word to help them. It is a path illuminating light that we have. This is a dark, sinful world full of all kinds of deception, self-deception. How are you going to see the right way to walk and where to put your foot? Well, the Word of God is a lamp that's furnished to us by God in this dark place. Thy Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, the psalmist says in Psalms 119. Jesus said, and this is the judgment that light is come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Here is a light that God has sent, a revelation that we have in the Bible. And it's showing us the way. It's showing us our error. Love the light. Those that uh, are going to be lost, they don't want their evil deeds revealed. When you study the Word of God daily, it makes you uncomfortable. Right? Um, it shows you things about you that need to be corrected. And we need to love that light and love that correction that it gives so that we can walk in the way that's safe and right. We're rejecting a great blessing if we reject the light of God's word. It enables the student to see himself as God sees him. I'm oftentimes surprised when I see myself in pictures and things like that. <laughs> like, I look like that, you know. I gained that much weight or I lost, you know, what, what, 
well, my tie, I, I see it's out of whack. I wish I'd looked in a mirror before I got up to preach. My tie is over there. I see that each week when I'm looking at those videos put up online. And uh, my hair got blown out of place and I didn't fix it or whatever. Well, what's the Bible? What, what's the mirror for your soul? What's, what's going to show you what your soul is like? How are you going to see that? We got physical mirrors. The Word of God is the mirror to help you see what you really are in God's sight and things that need to be corrected and that are askew. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. And after looking at it, he just goes away without fixing anything. No, we want to study the word of God, see what we've got to fix, and then fix it. So we all help, need help in seeing ourselves as we are. And as God sees us, view of what will come up at judgment. Well, the second lesson today is what does the Bible teach about the judgment? And there's a standard that's going to be applied to us on the judgment day. We don't want to go into court and not know what, what the law is and what the standard is and be surprised on judgment day. The only way to be prepared is to understand the law book and the standard will be judged by. I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. We're going to be judged by Jesus teaching those of us that live under the gospel. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day, on judgment day. The words of Jesus Christ, the gospel that was taught through the apostles, and revealed to us. That's going to judge us on the last day. So it's going to show us where the narrow road is so that we're not going to be found guilty of getting out of the way, following the broad way. It's going to teach us how to worship in spirit and truth. So we're not going to be surprised about the parts of worship that we should have practiced and how we should have done it. It tells us don't add to or take away so that Again, we won't be surprised that there's a strict standard applied on that last day because the Lord told us over and over again to follow his word exactly as he's delivered it and how we are to love that great commandment, to love our neighbor and our brethren, love uh, holiness, and we're trying to perfect it all the time. It'll stabilize us in doctrine and guard us against apostasy if we read our Bibles regularly. We'll be able to recognize counterfeit doctrines and things that aren't in harmony with the Word of God because we've become expert in the Word by reading it and studying it on a regular basis in our life. We're told in Ephesians 4 and verse 14 how it should be that we take advantage of preachers and elders and teachers that God has provided for us so that we can grow in the Word of God. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. People can fool you if you don't really know the genuine article when it comes to counterfeit money, I guess, or any kind of counterfeit. If you really know the real thing, they can't fool you. And false teachers won't be able to fool you with false doctrines if you know what the real doctrine is. In 1 Timothy 4.16, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both to yourself and to those who hear you. There's a charge given to a young preacher, and the principle would be the same for any of us, whether we're a preacher or not, that we want to pay special attention to the doctrine, be absorbed in it, and try to understand it. So when we pass it on to our children or our friends or other brethren, that we'll say the right thing. We won't... Uh, mislead them. It's safe for us and for them. And again, it, there are false teachers that abound. They're going to come into the church. They're going to arise from among us and have some part of the truth or a twisted idea about the truth and it'll mislead us if we're not studying. In Second Timothy, or Peter 2 and verse 3, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. We need to be strengthened and fortified for 
the battle against temptation and errors that are surely going to arise. Our generation's no different than those that live before us. All of them have faced different kinds of trials and temptations and errors that have come along and acts upon the faith. And we've got to be ready for that. In Hosea's day, the people were going to go into captivity. They were being destroyed because they didn't have knowledge of God's word and practice it. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you've rejected knowledge. I also have rejected you from being my priest since you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. They used to know it, but they didn't diligently study it, and now they've forgotten it. See what can happen to any of us? The way that Jesus resisted the temptations is he had the word of God in his mind, and he set an example for us. Every time the devil would offer him something, he'd say, it is written. And he knew what the Bible taught on that subject. He couldn't be deceived and uh, tempted to do wrong. Faith comes and is strengthened by hearing the word. The Bible was written to give us faith. So we need to use it. The shield of faith against all those fiery darts of the evil one. What is the shield? It's faith. Faith comes by hearing. Trusting in God's teaching, his revelation, and in him. So duty, we all have duties that necessitate that we study. We, we, you just can't fulfill what the Lord wants you to be without studying your Bible. I can't do it, and you can't do it, none of us can. We have a charge to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We can't do that without studying it first and understanding it. We're told that we're to make a defense for the faith. Being ready always to make a defense to anyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. How are you going to make the defense if you're not reading your Bible? You don't know where the scriptures are. Something we have to work on to fulfill that command. We're told we're to contend for the faith, to defend the teaching of the original faith that was delivered by Christ. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. You can't contend for the faith if you don't know it. If you're not well acquainted with it, you can't stand up for it. The Apostle Paul recognized he as an apostle was appointed for the defense of the gospel. Who's going to defend it now? Paul's not here. We're here. Who's going to defend it? We need to defend it, right? And uh, we can't defend it without reading it, without knowing it, without being dedicated to the study of it. Without knowledge, you just can't keep those commands. Study is going to build you up and give you a home in heaven. Now, there's a motivation, isn't there? <laughs> if there was no other motivation, oh, that, that's a supreme motivation there. That's what it's all about here today, isn't it? And every day we want to get to heaven and live with God forever. How are we going to get there? The Apostle Paul was leaving those elders there from Ephesus. He wasn't going to be with them. He didn't think anymore. Of course, it didn't work out that way. He actually did come back and see them some more. But for all he knew, it was the last time he would see them. <laughs> what did he hand them over to to take care of them? The Word of God. That's what he left them with. It says, now I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace. That's what will take care of you. Which is able to build you up, just like a house is built up gradually and becomes strong and so on. That's the way Christians are. We're gradually, constantly being built up like a house until we can get to heaven, right? That's what we're working on. And the Word of God, he says, is what is able to do that. The Word of God's grace. Well, it's it came from grace. God's favor gave us this Word. And it also produces for us and tells us about grace and faith. It reveals that, how to access that, that favor of God. Well, there's the back of the book. So I guess we'll stop there on that slide. Oh, brethren, this is a reminder to you. I know you say, well, I've heard this, I've heard this before. <laughs> and you'll ought to hear it again because we all need to be Reminded. I need to be reminded, and so do you. 
If you'll bow with me, we'll be dismissed.